Next, world leaders are in Belfast to mark 25 years of the Good Friday Agreement. But can Northern Ireland ever move on when the violence of the Troubles has not truly been acknowledged? I'm joined now by spectator columnist Douglas Murray and former leader of the DUP and now broadcaster Arlene Foster. Douglas, Arlene, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Now, Douglas, you write in the magazine this week about people who are involved in the Troubles now being held up and lauded as heroes and sort of men of peace. Um, can you tell us a bit about that to get us started? Uh, yes, it's something which, as I mentioned in my column in The Spectator this week, it, it is not new. Uh, we've just had the 25th anniversary celebrations of the Good Friday Agreement. We had, of course, Joe Biden flying into Northern Ireland for a matter of hours, then doing a sort of family trip around uh, the Republic of Ireland for a week or so. Um, uh, we had the Clintons arriving in Northern Ireland for a conference and um, a, a lot of people claiming uh, credit for the agreement. And I mentioned in my piece, uh, you know, let, let, let's not be sort of ungracious about this. The, the Good Friday Agreement has meant that violence in Northern Ireland has been down significantly for the last 30 years. It's not gone away, as many people on the mainland seem to think. Um, but we haven't had 3,000 more bodies, thank goodness. There's an enormous amount, that, an incalculable amount that must be said for it. But one of the things I say, the dissenting note I, I, I I put in is one that I've tried to put in before, which is that um, for many of us, it remains galling to see the people, and I'm thinking in particular here of Jerry Adams caught in a smiling selfie with President Joe Biden, seeing these people being venerated as men of peace who actually were exactly the opposite of that. Mm. And what I've said, and, and lest anyone think that I'm sort of... Um, you know, ignorant of the things that went on on all sides here. Remind people, you know, I wrote a book on Bloody Sunday 12 years ago. I attended the Savile hearings for many years into, in, into the atrocity of Bloody Sunday. Um, I'm not ignoring problems on any or all sides, but it is exceptionally galling that, as I mentioned in that book, uh, the people who said, don't shoot people in the head, whatever the circumstances, kept being left behind. And the people who believed in shooting people in the head for 30 years and then suddenly said, actually, let's not do that, are now lauded as the men of peace. It's still extremely hard to stomach. And I always fear that when we take the wrong lessons from history, the likelihood of repeating it is exceptionally high. Mm. And Arlene, what do you make of that? I mean. Is there a case that some people will make that we kind of need to put the violence behind us and not maybe not turn a blind eye to it, but kind of move on from that? Or, or do, are you more in agreement with Douglas there? Well, first of all, I mean, I remember the events of 25 years ago very well indeed. And um, I've listened to uh, various speakers over this last couple of days talking about um, the need to say yes and... Uh, they should sh people should show leadership by saying yes. And actually, 25 years ago, I said no to the Belfast Agreement. Um, and the reason I did that was um, because the agreement allowed terrorists to leave jail uh, without any uh, attention given in the agreement to those people who had paid the ultimate, that who had lost their loved ones, whose loved ones had been murdered. Uh, by the very people that were being let out of prison. And I found that not only morally objectionable, and it was and is morally objectionable, but also what message was that sending to people who had conducted violence uh, for a long period of time? What it, it sent the message to them that actually, um, in exchange for you stopping uh, your violence and in exchange for killing people, uh, you will now be able to stand uh, as a member of the Legislative Assembly. You will be able to become uh, a minister in the government. Uh, but yet, uh, and we know this very well, don't we, the legacy of what happened uh, all those years ago still hasn't been dealt with uh, and victims are still hurting. And what I found incredible yesterday was the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Chris Heaton-Harris, at the very large conference, which is largely Americans, uh, coming along and speaking to um, other academics and, and people from the Irish government and people from the UK government and all congratulating themselves on what a wonderful job they've done. 
Chris Heaton Harris gave a speech where he praised, wait for it, the courage and leadership of Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness, which I, I just find very difficult. And I think of all those victims who are listening to that, and I've looked at some of their uh, social media accounts today, and frankly, they're absolutely outraged. They're very hurt. And this just isn't victims from one side of the community to take up Douglas's point. This is victims from right across the community who feel that they are just forgotten about. And instead, we're going to glorify the people who were actually involved in murdering people for 25, 30 years. And what went through your head, Arlene, when you saw that picture of Jerry Adams and Joe Biden together in a, in a selfie? Well, I wasn't, in, you know, I, w I wasn't surprised by that at all. And I'm sure Douglas wasn't surprised either because uh, President Joe Biden um, has long been a friend of the Irish Republican and uh, movement. Um, he was photographed with Rita O'Hare, who was on the run uh, from UK authorities from 1972 for him, her involvement uh, in relation to the murder or the, sorry, the attempted murder of a soldier here in Northern Ireland. She then went on the run. Uh, and was wanted up until the time of her death just a month ago. Uh, but he had no difficulty in uh, standing for a photograph with Rita O'Hare. So it doesn't surprise me at all uh, that he that he stands for a photograph with Jerry Adams. Mm. And Douglas, you mentioned in your piece that you say after the peace process, you know, there's been sort of this poison in Ireland and Northern Ireland that hasn't been rooted out. I mean, do you link it to sort of the rise in a bit of sectarian violence that we've seen recently, for example, in the run up to the, the 25 year anniversary? Um, the, the problem is that it hasn't gone away and the Good Friday Agreement didn't make it go away. My own prediction has always been that the IRA would be back because it was throughout the 20th century and it was because the poison tree uh, has not been uprooted. I, I mention in the piece my late friend Sean O'Callaghan who acted as a, a double agent within the Army Council of the IRA, a man of exceptional bravery, who is my great honour to be friends with. Um, Sean spent the last years of his life writing, among other things, a biography of, of James Connolly, one of the heroes of 1916. And I remember when I asked him why he was devoting his, his, his what time he had left to this, he said, Connolly was the man who radicalised me and made me do terrible things. Sean himself, as a young man, killed people in cold blood, believing this terrible cause. And he said, I want to go, up, go back and dig that tree up. I want, to, I, I want to, to get the poison out. I want to do whatever I can so that it's not still there, so that the poison tree doesn't keep bearing bloody fruit. But when I look at pictures from the Cregan in recent days and of, of teenagers who don't remember the troubles going out with petrol bombs and gleefully entertaining themselves, you see once again that toxic mixture of boredom, romanticism and veneration of violence that is still there. And that's the cocktail. That's the cocktail. I mean, remember, well, one of the books that the, the, the provos and others still hate most is Malachi O'Doherty's uh, the, the, the Trouble with Guns. And the reason they hate it is because O'Doherty in that book highlights precisely this, you know, the way in which in Republican newspapers to this day, people sort of say, you know, uh, uh, comm commemorating our, our much loved son, you know, who's now with the angels, you know, who sort of blew himself up whilst trying to make an IED yeah. to put in a butcher's shop. You know, this sort of toxic poison tree is still there. And, you know, the politicians in Westminster and Washington like to think it isn't, but it is. And they've done nothing to address it. And in the case of Joe Biden, I'm afraid, he and other senior Democrats like Chuck Schumer, who spoke a couple of years ago at the Sinn Féin conference, calling for a united Ireland, which, as I always remind people, is as outrageous as an MP from Westminster going to America and calling for Texas to succeed from the union. Chuck Schumer, Joe Biden, these senior Democrats, they continue to actually water the poison tree. They continue to do so. Read some of the Boston newspapers on any of this. They're more radical than anything written on the radical left of the British uh, 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 journalistic system. Arlene, do you take such a negative view? Do you think that poison is still there? Do you think there is still the capacity for sectarian violence in, I in Northern Ireland? Part of the difficulty is we allow the glorification of past terrorism to continue. Uh, and whilst, of course, 
uh, those of us who live in Northern Ireland are very thankful that we don't live in the 70s and 80s, which I grew up in. And, 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 and I'm really glad that my children don't have to deal with that on a day and daily basis. But the glorification of terrorism continues. And therefore, you will see the leaders of Sinn Féin go to commemorations uh, for people who, frankly, were murderers. And uh, one that I know very well is Seamus McElwain, who killed a number of people in County Fermanagh, tried to kill my own father because he was a police officer, didn't succeed on that occasion because he was very young at that time. But he went on to kill a lot of people. And Martin McGuinness used to go to that commemoration every year and talk about what a wonderful person Seamus McElwain was. And that has an impact on young people because they look at that and they say, oh, this man must have been a great man and look what he did for Ireland, so-called. And that has an impact. And then you get into um, the situation where young people uh, today from a Republican background don't think there's anything wrong with chanting about the IRA. Ooh, ah, up the ra. They will chant in your face as if it's some cultural right that they have to do that. Whereas in actual fact, they are lauding people who used to go out and murder their neighbours on country roads in Northern Ireland. And it's wrong. And I think government have a responsibility to deal with that issue. And they haven't dealt with it over this past 25 years. They haven't brought about reconciliation, true reconciliation in Northern Ireland. Uh, It's just the absence of violence here. So therefore, it's not impacting on people in Westminster. And I I really regret that because if you're genuine about peace building, then you have to recognise where the difficulties are. And certainly the glorification is one of the things that we need to tackle. To to flip that on its head, Arlene, though, do you think the unionist side has come to terms with its own links to violence? Well, I don't know what you mean by the unionist side, because you see... When Douglas was first speaking, I, I was thinking to myself, uh, people often in Northern, when they're looking at Northern Ireland, separate us into Catholic and Protestant, Unionists and Nationalists. Actually, it was the law abiding people on one side and the terrorists of all hues on the other side. And the poor, unfortunate police service of Northern Ireland, or the RUC as it then was, in the middle, trying to keep those people who were law-abiding safe from uh, terrorists of whatever hue on the other side. So it, it, it does get frustrating for those of us who have lived through the troubles when you hear people think that because I'm from a unionist background that I would in some way be in favour of paramilitaries from a loyalist disposition. I'm not. I think those people shouldn't have been allowed out of prison either, frankly, and should have been dealt with in an effective way. But what happened in 1998 was that prisoners from loyalist paramilitaries and Republican paramilitaries were allowed to walk free. And I think that huge uh, thing that happened then, and Tony Blair has made reference to it uh, over this past week and said it was a terribly difficult thing, but it had to be done. Well, why did it have to be done? Why did we not stick by the rule of law and stick by the justice system and deal with those people who wanted to go out and murder and kill? Instead, we've allowed them to go free. And I think that there are consequences for that of a generational nature. And we're seeing those consequences now in places like Londonderry, unfortunately. Um, And it has to be stopped. By the way, John, if I may pick up and just add to Arlene's point, yeah, of course. I, mean, I think that yeah. this issue of equivalency is extremely yeah. important. I mentioned in the piece, I was no fan ever of the, the late Reverend Ian Paisley. I thought he was a sort of sectarian bigot, loudmouth of a kind I really don't care for. But the idea even that there was a sort of equivalency between Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness mm. is absolutely nonsensical. Reverend Ian Paisley was not leading torture gangs on a nightly basis, was not getting people to come uh, back to to Northern Ireland in order to murder them like Martin McGuinness did uh, on on occasions we can prove, where we have audio recordings and much more. Um, And as as for the the, the wider issue, I just go again on this issue of it, because it's, it's, as Arlene said, there's a sort of ease to, about making the equivalency. Well, all sides, etc. Et yes. I'm talking about the specific thing that, for instance, uh, uh, remind me, sorry, Arlene, Michael Stone was the, the madman. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. yes. Take, take the example of Michael Stone. Michael Stone carried out a set of sectarian killings uh, um, in Northern Ireland, including the famously the uh, attack in the cemetery 
um, of the, uh, uh, you know, during the funeral of the, of the bodies of the people who were brought back from Gibraltar. Now, uh, Michael Stone was a classic example of a sort of uh, um, a radical terrorist extremist from, from the other side. OK, here's the thing. Like, nobody is lauding Michael Stone. He isn't in a devolved assembly. He was not made, as Martin McGuinness was, a deputy first minister. He um, was not in charge of education in Northern Ireland at any point. Um, nobody thinks it's some incredibly difficult test to condemn him. We get back to this point that, you know, as I mentioned in the piece, the current head of Sinn Féin, the leader of the opposition in the Irish parliament in Dublin, is taken to be bloodied and pay, pay homage to Sean Russell, a Nazi and former IRA leader in the 1940s who died on a German U-boat. For once, the use of the term Nazi in 2023 is not hyperbole. The current head of Sinn Féin, Mary Lou Macdonald, is taken to pay homage at the statue of a murderer who was a Nazi who was leading a bombing campaign against British cities as the Luftwaffe was bombing those same British cities. And Mary Lou Macdonald has to pay homage. Why is it? What is it about this movement that means that you still have to pay homage to Nazis and terrorists and killers and bombers if you are to rise in the ranks of the movement? Does nobody see the problem here? You know, this is what I would like us to, to, to see addressed. And I've said before to endless Northern Ireland ministers, you know, there have been endless inquiries, inquiry after inquiry, and everybody could have one, but somehow it doesn't get to the root of the problem. Mm. So turning to the future, Arlene, do you, you know, that poison still exists, that sort of glorification of violence and so on. Uh, do you have any hope for the future of Northern Ireland? Do you think this can be resolved? Look, uh, I've been a politician in Northern Ireland since I was a teenager, and I think that you have to be an optimist if you're a politician in Northern Ireland, and I am an optimist. And the good people of Northern Ireland, those people who get up every morning, go to work, and want Northern Ireland to be a success, will make it a success. But that doesn't deal with the issues that are still there, remnants from our past, which are still infecting what's happening here today. And that has to be dealt with. And I think... Instead of allowing uh, Sinn Féin members to say that they're just speaking their truth and they're just remembering their patriot dead, they should be called out uh, and it should be pointed out that it is morally objectionable to laud people who went out to murder their neighbours for no other reason than they put on a uniform to try and protect citizens in Northern Ireland. That was it. And indeed, on many occasions along the border, all you had to be was a Protestant to get taken out because you maybe had a farmland that was near to the border and they wanted to have it for them uh, sold in a particular way. So, look, all of that sectarianism, all of the glorification of terrorism must be called out if we're to make any progress in reconciling in, in a true way in Northern Ireland and not just talking about reconciliation um, and if it's a nice, as if it's a nice thing to do and middle class people go along and they have a, a nice time together and that's seen in some way to be reconciliation. Reconciliation is about calling out the difficulties and the real challenges, not just trying to paper over the cracks. And therefore, we have to call out what's wrong. And for me, what is wrong is about the past glorification of terrorism, which continues to infect what's happening today. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Arlene, and thank you, Douglas. Next, Louise Perry writes the cover piece for this week's magazine about the ethical dilemmas of surrogacy. Can surrogacy ever be done in a way that is best for the mother and the baby? Louise joins me now. <laughs> 